Amen. Okay, so Colossians 1.15, this is Paul talking. He's describing Jesus, and he says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Say visible image. Visible image. He's, he's the visible image of the Old Testament God who is invisible. Have you ever had a struggle with the fact that you couldn't see God? That you couldn't just sit across, you know, a cup of coffee with God and like get to know his personality in that kind of a way. And in the Old Testament, that was definitely an issue, right? And like people, uh, Jesus came along and said, one of my ministries, one of Jesus's ministries is that he would be the revealer. He would be the one who we could actually see him and see the way he responds to situations and get to know his personality and thereby get to know God's personality. He existed before anything was created. He's supreme over all creation. Jesus, for through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. So for Jesus to be the visible image of the invisible God, first you got to believe that Jesus is God. So that's why it clarifies that point. And we looked at this last week that Jesus is the great I am from the Old Testament. Y-H-W-A-H, uh, Yahweh, he is, he's the absolute. He is the now, he's the, he's the complete, he's the eternal, he is the unchanging God. And all of that, that Jesus or that God is, Jesus absolutely is. He's the visible image. So there's seven different times in the book of John that Jesus, uh, not only does he clarify that he is the great I am, the ego I may, if you remember that from last week, um, he makes it very clear who he is. Um, not only does he say that, but there are seven different, what are called the I am statements of Jesus in the book of John, where he even takes it further. Not only does he say, I am the I am, but the I am is this. And so he'll turn it into a title. Today, he's going to say, I am the bread of life. So you can understand a whole new aspect of God and of Jesus if you understand that he is the bread of life. That's a, it's a part of him and part of what he gives to us. And these show up in the book of John. All seven of them are in the book of John. Um, and so you'll see that as we go along throughout the rest of this series. So he's the bread of life. So I'm going to give you some context for when this thing gets said, because it's not random. Okay. It's, it's, it's in context of a greater story about bread. So here's the situation. Jesus has been amassing followers for two years of his earthly ministry. If you know his timeline, Jesus started at age 30 and he was killed at age 33 and resurrected from the dead. Amen. Uh, so he had three years to do his earthly ministry. And so this is two thirds of the way through. And he's amassed so many followers. He gets to a spot where he goes to do a teaching and he's got over 5,000 men there listening to him speak, not even counting the women and children. Could have been 7,000, 8,000, 10,000 people. There's a ton of people there and they're hungry and they've got no food. And if you know the story, you know there's a kid and he's got a lunchbox, right? And it's got some fish and it's got some bread in it and goldfish, <laughs> live goldfish. Pro I'm probably, probably not, probably not. Um, anyway, so Jesus takes uh, the lunchbox and he, he multiplies it miraculously. And everybody, all these thousands of people miraculously eat from that single lunchbox. And, and it blows the people away. Like not only are they fed and their hunger is satisfied, but they take this as this massive sign that Jesus is the Messiah. And the reason they do this is because there was this random verse in the book of Psalms where it's describing David and, and David is king and the kings that would come after him. And one of the things that it says is the kings that co would come after him would bring an abundance of grain to God's people. And then some Jewish rabbi commentators looked at that and said, we think that means the Messiah is going to bring manna just like Moses brought manna, but it's gonna be manna 2.0 and it's never going to end. And God is gonna give us bread every single day for the rest of our lives. Well, they sort of got it right. But when Jesus fed the 5,000, they took it as that sign. And they took it as he's saying he's the Messiah. And the scripture says they, they go to make him king by force. And why would they do it by force? 
Well, because Jesus is way too slow for our program. Right? Like, if you know anything about Jesus, Jesus was always like, you know, I'm going to do this miracle, but keep it private and don't tell anybody I did it. And I'm going to tell you some special things about me and my divinity, but please don't tell anybody else I told you this. Because it was not his time yet. He was constantly saying, it's not my time yet. And he was slowing the ministry down constantly. And that was really infuriating some people. So they finally come along and they were like, no, he's finally, he's shown us his cards. We know he's the Messiah. We're ready for him to be king, actually. And we're going to take over Rome. So they go to make him king by force. And then Jesus escapes them somehow, miraculously. It's really a fun little uh, account there. Um, But just like Jesus has tried to escape um, attempted murder against him multiple times throughout the scripture, he has to escape these people who are trying to make him king. And in the text, this is John chapter 6 is where we're going. Um, Jesus goes to the, uh, the other side of a lake where they are. And some other things happen with the lake and stuff. But he's over there. And the people search for him, find him. And here's the conversation between them. John chapter 6, verse 25. But just one last thing I got to tell you. His group of followers might be somewhere between five and 10,000 people. It's a mega church following Jesus around. By the end of this particular passage, all of them, except for a few dozen, are going to leave and stop following him. Uh, What happens in this conversation is so offensive to them, they're going to leave. All right, verse 25. They found him on the other side of the lake and they asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? What time did you get here? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, you want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous signs. So first off, they asked him what time he got here and he doesn't answer that question, which is a classic Jesus move. Instead, what Jesus does is he says, you asked me the wrong question. The question you should have asked me was this. Um, You should have asked me what the miracle of feeding the 5,000 actually meant. You're actually here for bread. The bread actually pointed to a deeper miracle, which was that Jesus is God's son, and he's the one who can meet all of our needs, ultimately. Ultimately. You should have asked yourself what the purpose behind the miracle was. So verse 27, but don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy instead seeking the eternal life. That's Zoe, that's that the Greek is Zoe there. It's the transcendent life, the life with God, the eternal life that the son of man can give you for God the father has given him, given me the seal of his approval. They replied, We want to perform God's works too. What should we do? Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one that he has sent. He says, you're concerned about temporary food. God wants to give you transcendent life. Instead, focus on the right thing. And they're like, okay, so give us some work to do. Again, it feels like they're missing each other, doesn't it? Okay, give us some work because we want to do the works of God. I'll just say this. This is what religious people do. Jesus said, I'm offering friendship with God to you. you all, all I need you to do is for you to believe in me, have a relationship with me. And they're like, no, give us the 12 easy steps to heaven. We want the steps. If you give us the steps, we can do the steps. And then we could know we did the steps. Why don't you give us the steps? Because God is always trying to pull us away from religion. Why? Well, there's some reasons for that. Religion gets us stuck every single time. Religion is, if you give me the steps, then I can control the steps. Like, if you give me the steps, I might do 10 of them and leave two off, but we're not going to pay attention to that because those are the ones I really didn't want to do anyway. But I'm going to feel good about the 10 that I did. Right, and the 10, I can, I can kind of control and God needs to look the other way. And by the way, my ego feels really good about the 10 that I did. And I feel so good about the kind of good Christian that I really am, that I can look down on other people that didn't do 10 like I did 10. Like we do all of these things, right? That it is about ego and it is about control. And God's like, no, it's friendship with me. You gotta believe. Like friendship's hard, God. 
Friendship sounds kind of elusive. Do you ever walk in and you're talking to Christians and they're like, it's just about relationship, it's not about religion. And you're like, what does that even mean? And it gets you frustrated because saying to have a friendship with God sounds elusive. It sounds difficult to define. It sounds like it's out there. And that's part of the point. It's intentional because you have to come to God and you have to beg him for your next step. Say, oh, Jesus Christ, king of my life, what do you have for me next? Because it might be, this, but it might be different than yesterday. And maybe I did do 10 of the things, but it's these two things that are the secret that are gonna unlock my heart to Jesus. And I have to do those 10 things. See, it's about relationship. And he tells us what comes next. Verse 30, they answered, no, no, no. Show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. Can you believe they'd say that to Jesus? You just fed 5,000 people, but what have you done for me lately? Like you just gave us all bread, but we want more bread. Jump, Jesus, jump. After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. See, they're quoting scripture at the word of God. It's wild. So Jesus said, I tell you the truth, Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. You're trying to give credit to a man as if he made bread rain from heaven on people for 40 years straight? You got it wrong from the very beginning. It came from God. And now he offers you the true bread. It's interesting. Um, they got the, the fee in the 5,000. They turn around and they're like, we want more bread. This is a really good, uh, typical picture of humanity. If we get a miracle, we don't respond with great faith. We respond by wanting another miracle. That's the way that it works. Jesus is constantly talking through the gospels about the fact that he's not just looking for faith. He's looking for people who will believe without seeing. It's weird. The greatest miracle worker of all time was constantly saying, I'm looking for people who will believe even though they've never seen a miracle. That's what he actually wanted. Why? Because when you see the miracle, you responded to proof. You didn't respond in faith. You didn't have to believe or trust anything. And it actually keeps us small. It keeps us immature and shallow because if I saw the miracle and I think I'm trusting God based on what I just, the miracle that I just saw, I'm not going to now walk in great faith with him. I'm going to want a constant stream of miracles into my life in order for me to keep trusting God. I'm going to say, what have you done for me lately? And he's like, no, I'm not giving you any more bread. <laughs> the work is to believe I'm not going to give you religion either. The work is to have a relationship with me. Do you see him focusing them in? Yeah. They want manna 2.0. Um, we have a complicated relationship with bread. We have a complicated relationship with food altogether. Um, it actually started in the garden. Um, Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, chapter 3. Um, God gives Adam and Eve, if you remember the story, he gives them a garden full of food. He gives them all this food, gives them a wide variety of food, says, I'm going to take care of all your needs. You can choose any of it, except there's just one kind of food that you can't have. You know the story. But that's what we have to have, God. And they demand it. One thing I can't have, that's the thing I must have. God said, but I told you you couldn't have it. And that's where they could not agree. And so the curse came. But what, did, what was the curse? What was the essence of the curse? Is God said, I told you what you could have, what food would actually satisfy you. And you said, I must reach for and have the food that you told me I couldn't have. And God said, okay, then for the rest of your existence, mankind, men and women, you will reach for the food that will never satisfy you. You will continue for the rest of your days 
to reach after those things that just do not meet any of your deepest needs. Verse 17 in Genesis 3, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life, you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles. It'll work against you, though you will eat of its grains. You're just going to keep eating, but you'll never be satisfied. You're going to keep eating, and you're going to have to work so hard, but creation is going to work against you. We have a broken, complicated relationship with food. And it started in Genesis 3. We broke us. See, it's not the food that's broke. It's us. We can't be satisfied with the food that we get. Ask yourself this question. Why, why isn't this so much simpler? Why don't I just get hungry, step one, and then I eat some food, step two, and then I'm no longer hungry and I'm satisfied and everything's fine? Why doesn't it work that way? Why do I get hungry and I got to eat way too much and then I get to the end of it, I'm still kind of not satisfied. Or I got to eat the wrong things, and I'm definitely not satisfied because the more I eat the wrong things, the more I want more of the wrong things. And all this negativity comes into my life. It's just food. But it's complicated, right? Now go to the book of Exodus. Manna in the desert. Um, if you know the story, God's people get set free from the Egyptians and they were in slavery there. And Moses leads them out of Egypt, let my people go, right? And they go into the Sinai desert and he gets the 10 commandments and then they wander around the desert for 40 years and, and they need food to feed an entire nation of people. And so God gives them this miraculous manna from heaven. And the word manna is just this Hebrew phrase that, that means like, what is this? Um, that's all it means. What is it? Because when they saw the manna that appeared every single morning with the dew on the ground, they were like, this is a weird substance we've never seen before. But then they found out that they could actually grind that substance into bread and make different things with it. And that's what they ate as a nation for 40 years as God provided that manna to them. But he had rules with it. And here's where everything started to fall apart is he says, I'm gonna give enough manna for you every single day faithfully, and there's gonna be enough for everybody, but don't take extra for tomorrow. Well, they couldn't do that. Wait a second. All right, God gave me manna today, but how am I supposed to just trust that it's gonna show up tomorrow too? Like, well, like I gotta believe some things about God, that he loves me, that he cares for me. And so what they did is what we would all do. They, they started storing extra, like in containers and hiding it. And when they woke up the next morning, God's like, I saw that. And, and it was all rotted. You only get to take enough for today. And all of a sudden you start to hear pre-echoes maybe in your mind with the Lord's prayer. God, give us today my daily bread. Jesus taught us to pray, and he taught us to pray in a very specific way. God, I'm not asking for storage of bread for the whole next month. I'm asking for my bread today. Why? Because that's where the relationship is, and that's where there's got to be faith, and I've got to be led by the hand every single day like a child. Is it all starting to kind of, yeah, but they struggled with that. And not only that, but manna was only one flavor what happened to 31 flavors of manna, God? I mean, come on. And so then they say in, in uh, this Numbers 11 verse 5, it says, we remember the fish that we used to eat for free in Egypt. It was just a hilarious phrase because they were slaves in Egypt. Nothing was free. And we had all the cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlic that we wanted. But now our appetites are gone. All we ever see is this dumb manna. <laughs> Because isn't that the way? Not only can I not control it, God, but where's my flavors at? I'm bored with the manna that I've got. Do you hear the brokenness of Adam and Eve? Who it's like, it's, it's the very appetites and their ability to be satisfied itself that got broken in Genesis 3. We 
cannot be satisfied. Subversion, or I'm sorry, back to John chapter six with Jesus and verse 33. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Listen, it's not manna 2.0. It's not more bread. It's a person. And he tells them it's a person. So verse 34, sir, they said, give us that bread every day. They miss it. They still think he's on manna 2.0. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. It's not manna 2.0, it's me. I'm the bread. It's mind blowing, isn't it? I am. Ego, I me, Yahweh, I am. I am. God, who are you? I am the bread. I am the solution and the healing to everything that broke in Genesis chapter three in the garden. I am the one who is not just going to give you a one-time meal and then you're going to be hungry tomorrow. I'm the one who's going to fix your hunger. See what he's saying there. He's like, I see the actual problem. You've not had bad bread. You're a broken person. Your satisfaction receptors can't ever be satisfied. You can't ever feel full. Hmm. Um, in 1950, the average size of a new home was 983 square feet. Because this is about more than bread, right? Um, 983 square feet in that average size home housed 3.8 people on average. By 1970, which is the decade I was born in, the average size of the home was 1,500 square feet. So that's quite a growth. Today, it's 2,500 square feet. And only 2.6 people live in that average home today. So that represents a 270% increase in the amount of home space that we require in an average American home per person. Do they actually need that much extra space? <laughs> we could literally house all of America in our storage units. <laughs> you know it's true. But here's the shocker. Even though we de demand historically more and more and more and more, 39% of people in the U.S. this last year said they are more anxious than they were the year before. That their anxiety is just going up. They've got more space and they've got, I mean, we're not even talking about the fancy level of houses. We're not even talking about the, the, the measurements that they've done on the size of dinner plates, because they have. I think around that time, it was nine inches wide was the dinner plate, and now it's like 13 inches. Because we got to have more house, and we got to have nicer house, and, and we've got to have more food, and, and it just goes on and on. Here's the thing. Why isn't more house, money, food, and sex making us happier? Why isn't it? Because it's not. Here's why. Because we believe a lie. We believe a lie that says the reason I'm not happy today is because I don't have what? And the reason I'm not happy today is because somebody took away this out of my life. And if only I had this, I would be happy on the other side. That's a lie. Happiness isn't on the other side of you getting the thing, no matter what it is. It's that your peace and fulfillment receptors stopped working in Genesis 3. And you don't know how to be happy anymore. There is no correlation between your happiness level and what you have. And the problem is, is that we think that there is. The reason we chase it so much is because we're convinced, along with the rest of the world, that that will be the secret to our happiness. It's what we believe. Uh, Shaquille O'Neal, uh, who was some version of an athlete, I guess, um, 
he, he sat down. I don't mean that offensively. I just don't know much about it. Um, <laughs> um, he sat down with Jason Kelsey. Some of you sports people are taking me the wrong way right now. I just don't know things, okay? That's, that's all it's about. Um, he sat down with another sports person named Jason Kelsey, and both of them used a ball in their sport, I'm pretty sure. Um, but they sat down and they had a conversation, and I guess J Jason Kelsey was, um, am I saying that right, Kelsey? All right, thank you. Um, <laughs> I guess he's retiring, and um, Shaq was sitting down with him, and they had food there at the table. I, they, they had mayonnaise bottles there. I'm not sure why, like seven of them. And I just pixelated those out. You're welcome, because uh, I was offended. Uh, I didn't want to look at that nonsense. Um, anyway, um, it took me a while to figure that out too, by the way. It was worth it, totally worth it. Um, so anyway, they're having this conversation. And Jason Kelsey is about to retire. And, and Shaq gets really serious in the midst of the conversation. And here's what he says to the guy. He says, my advice to you is that if you're going to retire, just accept it. Enjoy your family, brother. I made a lot of mistakes to where I lost my family and didn't have anybody. So enjoy your beautiful wife. Enjoy your beautiful kids. And never dwell on what we had back when we were, you know, cameras were following us 24 seven. And he said, I lost my whole family. I am currently in a hundred thousand square foot house by myself. And that's all I got. <laughs> now, is he just trying to be depressing? No. He's a guy who's actually living this out in an extreme way. And he's trying to warn somebody else. It's like, you know, we went from 958 square feet to 2,500 today, and Shaq's in a 100,000 square foot house. That's what he just said. And it's empty. And what he's telling you is his soul is empty. What good is it to gain the whole world and let yet forfeit your soul? We don't have a more food problem. You don't have a more food problem. You've got a satisfaction. You've got a stomach. You've got a broken stomach problem. That's what's going on here. St. Augustine said, Thou hast formed us for thyself, and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in thee. The Bishop of Hippo, St. Augustine, wrote that around 300 AD. And he knew deeper things about humanity than most of us do. Says there's a God-shaped hole inside of your heart and you're trying to fill it with everything else and it just won't go. You keep coming out the other side worse off than what you started. And here's the thing, in order to get out of this mess, you're going to have to turn from that other false savior to the real one. You're going to have to turn and you're going to have to renounce false bread before you can actually embrace the real bread. And that's the step you're going to have to take before things change. Part of my story, my bread, um, I was a lonely guy and didn't have good friendships and was trying to chase, or constantly trying to chase after good relationships. And by good relationships, I meant people that were safe for me, people that were kind back to me. I was constantly chasing after relationships, but the way I had been taught relationship was, was people pleasing. And so I was constantly trying to try to get people. And I would I would do things that I was not proud of and I would sacrifice my integrity along the way just to get a friendship with people. And, and, and here's the dark thing, and some of you guys know this, the more you people please in that kind of an extreme desperate way, the more you seem to attract cruel people to you, not kind people. And that's what I attracted. And it was brutal. And so when Jesus saved me, one of the things that he did in my life right away, like first six, nine months of my Christian journey was I had to stop chasing after people and I had to call Jesus and my friendship with him enough. 
I had to call it enough and, and, and stop, just stop all of this. And God, you're so enough for me. And I'm going to center myself completely on you as the solution, as the source, as the bread to satisfy what's deep in me so much. And, and to some of you, that's a really scary thought to start doing that kind of thing because what it sounds like is it sounds like nothing and you're wrong. To call Jesus enough is not nothing. That's where the faith comes in. You actually start to do that and you find that he's everything. And there's, yeah, there's, there's a component where maybe from the outside looking in, it doesn't look the same way that other things did before, but it started to change me very slowly, inch by inch, moment by moment, I started to change because I was no longer reaching desperately for people. I started to relax. And I started to seek Jesus so much that a truth and a life and a, a wisdom started to come into me very, very slowly. And all of a sudden there was something that I had to maybe even give to other people just a little bit. And the right kind of people started to look my direction because I wasn't so desperate and needy and unhealthy. And God fixed relationships. But here's the thing, I had to make him king first. And I didn't know the formula to get myself out of the rut that I was in over here. I didn't know it. And there were a lot of moments where it was terrifying because if I give up all these old ways that I have of trying to guarantee that I'll get people into my life, if I let go of all of that, how do I trust? You just do. You have to. It's the only way. Jesus had to be enough. Jesus has to be enough for you. Uh, Pastor Jamin uh, Roller said it this way, or Jamin Roller said it this way. He says, all other breads will break you. Jesus finds us starving to death with a stomach full of savior substitutes, but Jesus is the only bread that will break for you. Love the way he put that. You have come to church today, all of us, all of us. This message right here just brutalized me this week. Because I'm still struggling with savior substitutes in my own life. Just be real with you. I need this one. And there's so many different kinds, guys, in our life that still kind of haunt us, but we, we've got to look at those savior substitutes and we have to renounce them and we have to tell Jesus that he is enough for us and we have to live that way and, and let him be king. See, for some of you, it's, it's approval and it's the opinions of others. That's become your false bread in your life and you just keep devouring that stuff, hoping that you're gonna feel filled and it never fills you, does it? Right, it's like even the compliments, you can't get enough compliments that actually last inside of your heart that make you a stable person. Even the compliments, they're gone in an instant, aren't they? And you need a thousand more. And you've become so addicted to the world of compliments in order to feel okay about yourself that as soon as critique comes along, you're crushed by it. And you know what I'm talking about. Neither side of that equation is fulfilling you in any way. You have no peace. But you can, I just give you testimony. You can come to a place with Jesus Christ where he can give you a sentence and it can last you a decade. You can live on it. The word of God specifically spoken to you and you can live on it and it can sustain you for a decade. But you gotta come into his program. And you've got to give up the things that he calls you to give up because he's king and you're not. You got to fix the hunger problem that's inside of yourself. It's the same thing with relationships. I talked about relationships before. Some of you are in broken relationships right now. You're in an adulterous relationship. You're in an, a relationship that you know does not honor God. And you've reached out to it and you've taken it into your life because you desperately feel like you have to have this relationship. I can't be alone. I don't know how to be alone. And so I'm willing to compromise and just take on this relationship. And it's, it's destroying you. It's hurting you. And to let go of that 
and to say, Jesus, for the first time in my life, I'm going to call you enough, and I don't need that to be enough. And watch how he begins to change things. And yes, he is king, and he's going to call you to do very specific things in your life. Don't be surprised at that. He expects you to do stuff, and he expects you to walk away from stuff, because that's what he is. He's not a passive little savior without an opinion because he's a nice grandpa in the sky. He wants better for you. And so he will speak into your life and you need to surrender to him. He's got better bread. What are all your savior substitutes, right? It's, it's your dreams and it's your jobs and it's your, it's your retirement. It's, it's all of the things. Some of you are married today and Every single husband in this room has had a week where you were not satisfied by your wife. And when that happened, you came to the conclusion that she was not being enough for you as she should. You're a wife in the room and you came to the end of a week and he did not meet your needs the way that you expected him to. And maybe he did in the past and he's not doing it anymore. And maybe he did not meet your expectations that you had when you came into the marriage. But your lack of satisfaction today, you've taken that lack of satisfaction the way the world takes it. And you've said something's wrong with him. And he's in between me and my happiness. That's a lie. Jesus is enough. For a Christian in a Christian marriage, love your spouse. But Jesus is enough. Jesus is, it, Jesus is not somehow not enough just because you're in a Christian marriage. You also need the spouse to be enough. That's a lie. You will be a better spouse if Jesus is enough for you. Well, that might mean sometimes I've got to go without. Yes, it will. <laughs> there are times of going without as he retrains your appetites. Absolutely. You're going to have to let him be king. John 6, 66, This is the end of the story. At this point, many of his disciples turned away and they deserted Jesus. They could not handle what he had to say. Then Jesus turned to the 12 and asked, are you also going to leave? Let me just explain. We've skipped over several verses there. There was a section in the passage where Jesus could tell that people were hardening their hearts against him. They did not want to accept him the way that he was. And so Jesus brought mystery forward, which he often does. And he started to say much deeper, harsher things to him. Like, you know what? You're going to have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. What do you think about that? You're offended? Let me really offend you. And they all began to turn away. And what was thousands of followers, an entire megachurch following Jesus, they all walked away except for a few dozen. Are you also going to leave? He asked them. Notice the gentleness of Jesus. He does not command them to stay. He asks them. Verse 68, Simon Peter, Lord, to whom should we go? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. When Peter says it, it sounds like a disappointment. It sounds like, I, I don't have a better Messiah waiting in the wings, Jesus. You're all I got. Maybe he wished in the moment Simon Peter did that he had a better Messiah waiting in the wings after that speech. I don't know. But he said, you're enough for me and I'm not going anywhere. And in that moment, Peter became the wisest man alive. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, the man who has any conceivable alternative to Christ is not a Christian. I'll give you that one more time. The man who has any conceivable alternative to Christ is not a Christian. I don't think he's threatening our salvation there. I think he's just calling a spade a spade. If you're gonna walk the actual Christian life, you don't have alternatives to Jesus. Why don't you go ahead and stand?
The good news is if you let him, and if you let him in, Jesus will fix it. Jesus will show you how to have a proper appetite, how to be actually fulfilled, how to be happier. My testimony, I'm the happiest today I've ever been in my entire life. And I've given up so much. You'd be shocked at some of the things I've given up. I give it all up again. Because he keeps his promises. And he changes us the way that he said he would. He brings us joy the way that he said he would. So we're going to pray together right now. And I'm going to give you an opportunity. If you were here with us at Easter two weeks ago, I gave you an opportunity to reach out to Jesus and ask him to save your soul. If and some of you, I kind of surprised you that day and you weren't ready for it, but you're back today and maybe you are ready. So I'm gonna walk us through this prayer. We're doing baptisms in two weeks. I'd love for you to cross this line of eternity with God that you've never crossed before and give you a chance to do that. We'll pray that prayer together. If today's your day and you are going to give Jesus everything. Um, we've got a tiny thing to give you. We've got free Bibles in the back, really nice study Bibles, and we want you to start this relationship of seeking after Jesus. Um, so just go back to where our sound booth is back there and ask somebody for a Bible. They'll hand you one. We're going to do baptisms in two weeks, and you might want to get water baptized and take your faith public. Pray with me. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if you would confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, two very straightforward steps, but not easy to do, then you will be saved. So you might be praying this with me right now for yourself. You don't have to say the words out loud. It can be in your head. God sees you. He knows what's real. Dear Lord Jesus, we are exhausted from the chasing of all the things that have left us empty. You are the better bread. You are the bread of life, and we want you. And so, God, right now, we choose, we say that you are enough, Jesus. You are our King. You are our Lord. You are our Savior. Come be enough for us. And Lord, we renounce the other stuff. Forgive our sins. Forgive our past. Bring us into new life. In Christ's name, amen.